welcome to my gathering basket. My name is Danelle. Thank you so much for coming back to join me this week. I have had another interesting couple weeks when it comes to the fiber art and homesteading, gardening. It just seems like this time of year, everything hits at once. I don't know about your, um, your life and the kinds of things that you do, but fall just seems, boy, it's busy. So I'd like to share just a little bit of what I've been doing with you. It is sweater weather here, at least for today. This is Southwest Missouri and it's gonna change. Um, today has been all about shawls and sweaters, um, hot tea. It topped out, I believe, at 66 degrees Fahrenheit this afternoon which for us is kind of odd. And I know in a few days it's gonna be back up towards 90 degrees and be um, time for t-shirts and all again for a while before it really sets in seriously cold. But at least for this little bit of time, it's been so much fun to um, work on sweaters and look at um, bringing in food for preservation. Um, it's just definitely feeling like fall. So I hope you're enjoying that wherever you are as well. To start off, it has been um, back to spinning a little bit more for me this um, last couple weeks. I have my Angora project I'm still plugging along. I haven't done much with that in the last, uh, since I talked to you last. I told you I was going to work on another fiber optic braid just to get some color since everything else I had been doing was um, pretty neutral, natural colors. So. I picked up a fiber optics braid and I got it all split up like I said I wanted to and put it on my e-spinner and let's see if this will yep there we go that's pretty true to color this is I it's a hot pink to almost an orange and yellow gradient um, by fiber optics so popped that off of my e-spinner I have if I can gather it up real quick, my ball just fell apart. I have that much more to go and it is blowing out just a little bit in the sunlight. Um, it has been so gloomy gray the last few days that it's kind of hard for me to close the curtains and, and block out the sun. So excuse some of the glare, but I have this little bit of orange and then into this bright, bright sunshiny yellow yet to go. So I'm, I'm very close to being finished with that half of the braid. I elected to split that braid in half, and this is the first half. I'll then spin the other half onto another bobbin. I'm still slightly uncertain whether I'm going to go ahead and chain ply each of those and have two thicker skeins of yarn, little mini skeins. Um, it was about 50, I think they, when I weighed the balls of fiber, they ended up being really close. Um, I, Actually, I was pleased how close they came for dividing, um, just just tearing it by eye. So I think I had like 51 and 53 grams in the two balls of fiber. So option one was to, my, my original plan was to do some color work mittens with those. I think that'd be so pretty with a um, contrast with a black background and do some um, Norwegian style um, like selbu mittens. I think it would be really pretty with that. Um, so that's option one. Option two, I ran across a colorwork hat that's in fingering weight. So this is spinning up. I'm spinning it in a woolen style. It is a prepared top. So it's going to be a semi, semi woolen, semi worsted. A um, little bit of argument, even in teachers, and exactly what you call something that has been prepped in a worsted manner the top, and then spun in a woolen manner. So I'll have a semi yarn, and I think when I did my little ply back samples, if I do a two ply, I'll have just a little bit of a heavy fingering weight. If I do a three ply, I'll be closer to a sport-ish weight, is kind of what I'm estimating. So I found a really pretty fingering weight color work hat option. And I think if I ply those two halves together and make a fingering style yarn, fingering weight, I think that could be a really pretty, again, color work hat. So anyway, I can, I can, I'm a really good, 
person for putting off decisions <laughs> if I can. And I think both of those would be good options for that yarn. Um, but I'm gonna at least get, get the singles and kind of think about it, see what um, I'm thinking as I spin it. But really happy to have that. And a couple weeks ago, I had some sort of, I, I have no idea what I did, um, but kind of injured my hand a little bit. Um, so it's been a little bit painful to work on some of my uh, worsted spun, spun projects, like my lace weight Angora. So that's why I switched to a, a woolen style spinning here. For me, I find that's a little less stressful on my hands. Um, and it definitely goes faster <laughs> than, than a worsted draw. So that's what I'm kind of what I've been doing with that. I am really tempted, for those of you that spin, you've probably heard of Ply Magazine's 51 Yarns Project, where they have a book that describes 51 different types of yarns, um, styles, fibers, preps, just different, different unique um, spinning experiences. I haven't bought the book, I'm tempted, I keep looking at it, but they also have a spin along going online you can through Instagram and I think on Ravelry they have um, all of these prompts so 51 of them they started last April and they're going through next March till the next ply away conference in Kansas City so every week you have a prompt of a different type of yarn to spin and then post pictures and they pick a winner for a free year-long subscription to ply magazine so I've looked at that, I've been following it, some great Instagram stories, um, some podcasts that are, are showing their adventures trying to, to keep up with those 51 yarns. I at first totally dropped out because I knew I was not going to spin a different sample of yarn every week. I tend to do very long projects, at least for me. I, I'm not a fast spinner, I don't spend a lot of time spinning. So I didn't join up with that originally. But there's not a requirement to do every one of them. So I was reading something um, here in the last week or so, again, about that project. And I, I went on their website and you can get all of the prompts. So you can actually do this for free. You don't have to make a purchase like the book. And um, several of the prompts that are coming up in the next month or two are things that I wanna try anyway. So I'm kind of thinking, for example, I believe in three weeks or so, um, one of them is going to be cotton. Well, I'm always playing with cotton anyhow, so maybe I will try. I've got various, I think five or six, I bought a sampler of five or six different types of cottons um, about a year ago, and just little tiny, like one ounce samples of them. So that might be a good excuse for me to try that. Related to this project though, I believe in two weeks, the prompt is chain ply. So if I do choose to go ahead and do the thicker weight chain ply, then that might be a good excuse to join in with that, um, that online conversation with spinners. So if you haven't, if you are a spinner and you haven't heard of that, uh, definitely look it up. Um, like I said, on the Ply Away website, they have a link to all of the prompts. It's just listed out. Um, this week is chain ply, this week is cotton, this week is boucle, this, and um, it, it might be a good excuse to try some different things in spinning and kind of branch out a little bit. So there's that you can look at. Um, and then I think last week or last episode, I told you I was spinning some yarn up that I wanted to knit a pumpkin out of. And you guys, I got it done. So this actually turned out quite large. <laughs> and I used all of the colors, uh, the, the orange and the dark and light orange. And then of course it didn't take a whole lot of the green just to make a little stem. Um, and then I had some other hand spun left over from another project uh, in this brown, natural brown. So I just made a few crocheted tendrils to pop on here. So pretty happy with how I had intended to make a couple small pumpkins and I, I started knitting and I just it was it was gonna be with the weight the weight of the yarn I made a, a chunkier yarn and so it, it just kind of turned out 
larger than I anticipated and I thought okay I'm just gonna put both of those into um, into one pumpkin and I'm, I'm pleased with how it turned out got it all stuffed and put up and I'm trying my best to hold off for a few more weeks before I put it out on my counter but this is the pattern it's a free pattern on Ravelry and let's see it is the knit pumpkin by Katrina McNearney and I, I linked to it and I'll try to remember to link to it again this week um, so several of you said that you were going to try knitting some pumpkins too so I'm glad I was able to link you up with that pattern it was a fun one to knit I remembered again why I don't work a whole lot with bulkier weight yarns um, by the time I got done my hands were definitely um, like I said they had already I, I had stressed somehow one of my hands and so by the time I got done with the chunky needles and the the chunkier yarn um, I couldn't work a whole lot at one time on this so I, I did it over a couple evenings and the little tendrils like I said are just crochet um, single crochet is famous it just one of its properties it naturally forms those little tendrils so I just chained I think 24 five or so stitches and then worked a single crochet back along it and it just naturally does that little spring thing so popped sewed some of those um, on there that also kind of hid where I I had stitched in my stem so knit pumpkin a lot of fun totally encourage you to do it uh, did take a little bit more yarn than I anticipated um, but I, I had just enough and was able to make that little pumpkin so I may try to make a few more I am not sure I definitely want to make some smaller ones to go with it maybe about half that size I also when I was looking at this uh, putting together my stuff for recording um, I got to looking and I had I had played around with kind of smooshing it um, I, I think I probably did this at a little bit looser gauge and if you look close don't look close <laughs> if you look close you can see some of the fiber fill Actually, in this case, I couldn't find my fiber fill, so I had scraps of quilt padding <laughs> that I rolled up and put together to, to stuff it with, and it worked just fine. But my gauge is just a little bit looser, and if you look close, you can see the white. So, like I said, don't look close. Um, but when I was, so I kind of smushed it around to think, well, if it was a little bit smaller, maybe that would tighten up the gauge. And when I set it down, I went, apple. So I'd kind of like to try the same pattern, with some red and green yarns and see if I could make an apple and instead of the curls maybe put a little leaf um, I don't know I just kind of um, like I said when I was looking at it across the the table I thought ooh, that could be fun so um, there you go there's your inspiration um, definitely fun as a pumpkin and quite possibly as an apple too so that project did get done I was I was very excited to actually try that once um, kind of nice to tick things off your list occasionally so that kind of bridges between my spinning and the knitting projects um, what I am wearing like I said oh it's been fun to slip on a cardigan um, this morning and this and was able to wear a chalet to church this morning and it felt so cozy and nice this was uh, an old, another older project of mine it is very simply another hitchhiker you've probably seen thousands this was some hand spun that I did a while back out of some greenwood fiber art fiber arts I believe um, a, a kit gradient kit that she did this is there are several if you look up the hitchhiker pattern Martina Bain, um, it is it doesn't have these these little eyelets in it but there are several people on Ravelry that have put their notes on how they did. I believe it's like this is an eight row repeat and on the eighth row um, they just did a yarn over knit one, yarn over knit one kind of thing. So look at, um, I, I can't remember if my Ravelry project, if I linked to one of those or not, but definitely just look at um, Martina Bames pattern and you can look down at the notes, the project, go to the projects tab and look at the pictures and you can see a number of people that have listed it. Um, fun variation. I really like the way it turned out and having it in my hand spun is just, um, just makes it a little bit more meaningful. So that's what I'm wearing today. And then as far as other knitting projects, my big one, again, I'm getting so close, but my big project has been working on the sugar maple sweater. 
I believe last time I was right about where these pink stitch markers were. This is by Karina Spencer and I'm working on um, a color concepts gradient kit from my friend Peggy at the 100th Sheep and I am just about ready to add on my last color in the kit. And again, I'm sorry that light is blowing this out. I don't know if there's a, there, 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 that's better. Um, so you can definitely, now that I've got them all in there, you can see the color shifts in this, which I really, really like. I'm, I'm really happy with the way it's, it's turning out. The only hitch, and this has kind of a um, asymmetrical neckline and then just a slip stitch that kind of emphasizes that. It'll be have a, mm, hard show on the needles again, um, but it's gonna have a pointed hem in the front and then it's kind of like a high low, so a, a higher back. The only problem was I thought I was going to get it all finished with just the one kit, which is six different colors. I have a teensy bit of this last color left and then this blue, kind of a steely blue to finish up. When I got to measuring how much I length I got with each color, I, I really thought at first I was going to have enough to finish. But now it's looking like I'm going to be about an inch and a half or so short. So I messaged my friend Peggy in a panic, not really, but messaged her and said, you know, SOS, do you have any ideas? I know I'm gonna run short and I'm trying to get it all finished in time for fiber days, and it, or at least finish my yarn before fiber days, which is the fiber guild that I belong to. That's kind of our little show, regional show, um, that's going to be, oh my goodness, this is, this is, I'm recording on Sunday, so it will be the end of next week. Oh, it's coming up, I'm not ready. But I, I she will be selling, she'll have a, a booth, I sh actually, do a little bit of a, a booth inside of her. She lets me put a table of my bags in her booth. So I'll be working with um, Peggy and Jeff of the 100th Sheep um, during that festival. So I wanted to have at least the yarn that I have all knit up. So I would know either I have enough, yay, I'm done, or no, I'm gonna run short and be able to um, have her help me find a seventh color that I can put into this sweater. So I gave her a heads up and just said, you know, I'm gonna be looking, uh, keep your eyes open as you're dyeing. Um, she was just dyeing this colorway when I talked to her. And she said, do you want me to pull a skein off of that? And that's one possibility. I'm probably going to try to find, I know that I won't be able to, Peggy is an amazing precision dyer. If there's anybody that could match this on another die run, it would be Peggy. But just on the chance that it's not quite the same, um, I'm probably gonna be looking for something in um, either a, a little bit lighter blue um, or kind of a, a gray color, something like that. So um, she said, okay, I, I can save you something now or if you wanna just look at Fiber Days, um, we'll see if we can find something, but we'll get you fixed up. And I knew she would be able to. So that's my, my sugar maple. I am, I am so close to being done. <laughs> I'm very excited about that. <laughs> um, so I will soon be wearing that, I hope. The other knitting, that's been occupying a lot of my knitting time between finishing the pumpkin and trying to get that done. And like I said, just trying to, I, am I the only knitter that, that kind of falls for that? If I knit fast, the yarn will last longer? <laughs> And then I, when I texted my friend Peggy, um, I, I said, okay, Peggy, I was playing yarn chicken and I'm pretty sure I'm gonna get plucked. <laughs> but I'll knit fast and see what, I've, see what I can get done. So that's taken most of my knitting time. Um, like I said, fiber days is coming up in just a few days now and I've been trying to panic sew. <laughs> and the sewing I thought was gonna be a little easier on my hand too. So I've been making some project bags um, just to take to, like I said, this is, this is primarily our guild. Um, it's, it's a small show, but we do have a lot of great classes. It is geared to education, um, which I am very fond of. Um, we have, for a small group, we have a crazy number. I, I wanna say there was somewhere in the area of 25 or 30 classes that were gonna be available on that, anywhere from 
book binding to leather working to weaving, spinning, knitting, crocheting, um, basket weaving. We have a couple Angora rabbit breeders that will bring their rabbits and do classes on rabbit care. And so a, a really good, it's small. We do everything we can to keep it inexpensive. If you live in this area and have that day off, I'll put the link below um, again to that, our, our website um, that has all the information on time, states, locations, all of that. It's, it's a great show. Um, it is not a Rhinebeck. It's not a Stitches. We have no intention of that. But we do have, um, I believe there's somewhere 18, 20 vendors. Um, most of us are involved in the guild in one way or the other. So again, it's a very sh small show. It's the only one I do. Um, I do throw some of my bags occasionally up into my Fiber Crafty shop. If you have not been on Fiber Crafty, um, I would encourage you to go look. It's a newer site. It's been around for about a year and a half now. And uh, Pam, the creator of the site, bills it as a online fiber festival. It is really just fiber things. So a lot of really good shops um, on that and bag makers, dyers, um, all sorts of supplies, fiber for spinning, um, dye stuffs, um, but really just related to, to fiber arts. So it was kind of nice. Um, I opened a little itty bitty tiny shop. I really only have a few things at a time, but I'll put a link there. And if you want to check any of those out, you're more than welcome to pop over there and visit and definitely check out the other people that are on Fiber Crafty too. Okay, add aside. Other knitting. <laughs> I have, um, I, I jumped into the Yarn Hoarder Dishcloth Challenge a while, well, right in, in January when Amber started that, and probably a lot of you are aware of that or also knitting for that. So in August, I was able to, I started out the year doing about eight. If you're not part of the dish, Dishcloth Challenge, um, Amber started this as a way to get her supply of dishcloths for gift giving and to use up her stash of cotton yarns. So um, her goal is to do 52 dishwash dishcloths this year and doing one a week. So I jumped in and I was in a little bit of a knitting slump um, back in that point. I had finished some big projects and just wasn't sure what I wanted to do next. And so I jumped into that also, and I had given a bunch for Christmas gifts. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll try this at least for a, a couple months. And um, so I was doing like eight oh, a month at that point, partly because it was fun knitting. It had been a long time since I'd done dishcloths, um, and I was really having fun. I, I finish one and cast the next one on, and um, I was really kind of enjoying that that quick project. And then also I knew that come summer with garden and all that that going on, I wouldn't be able to keep up with the, the one a month or one a week and be able to keep my totals. So the first few months I did a bunch, like I said, about eight every month, and then come about May, June, I my totals definitely plummeted. <laughs> so I am back on track. And again, sorry, the light is blowing out. There we go. Um, I got my four done this, this month. So I'm glad to be back on track and I have my September supply already started. These are um, made, these are just kind of a traditional bias dishcloth version of grandma's favorite. The version that I have been following for the most part, for the most part, um, is a newer, pattern called the dishcloth recipe and that's by Robin I think it's Robin Wiest um, she sits and spins on um, Instagram so uh, she put this one out I've done similar versions hers was just a little bit clearer written I believe than some of them and the main difference in hers is um, it's one of those that includes the um, two row short row shaping in the center so some patterns people have have problems with them getting kind of out of square the square i still have problems with the top and bottom coming out they they kind of do it's on the bias so to some extent that's to be expected but sometimes this corner comes out just a little bit long but when you do those little short rows and again i'll put a link to the pattern i used below um, but when you do those little short rows at the corners, it, it does help kind of square that out. 
So I've been doing that. Um, and then I've also been doing some that are just a uh, kind of a, a waffle weave sort of thing, just knits and pearls, blocks of knits and pearls, um, and makes this, uh, I can't see it, variegated yarn and sunlight, not a good combination. So anyway, it's just kind of a, it looks more like a, a waffle weave kind of thing. So I've got several of those made up to put into my pile. I'm, like I said, very happy to be back on track with Amber's challenge. And um, hopefully I'll be able to carry that through the rest of the year and I'll have my little gift pile. Um, well, I have a gift pile. I've actually sold some at Farmer's Market. And then um, a lot of them I will go ahead and just put in my own supply so that down the road when I am tired of doing dishcloths, I have fresh ones that I can use. Um, what I have been doing is using these, um, but the grandma's favorite kind of dishcloth, the little bias ones. These are my dishcloths that I keep in the kitchen. And then when I do the waffle weave ones, um, I put those in my bathroom as face cloths. So that's kind of how I've been keeping, um, a little variety in my in my dishcloth knitting <laughs> so that's pretty much been oh oh and then this so I told you I was um, I had finished ripping apart all of the old stitching that I did on my quilt a couple episodes ago and I was hoping to put this on the long arm quilting machine if you follow me on Instagram you saw that I posted a really short video of me quilting this the other day um, we just got one quilt off of the quilting machine at work and I work um, kind of on a fill-in basis at a quilt shop here in our town so I was able to um, throw my quilt on after we closed the shop and get the quilting done so I'm probably not gonna be able to show you up close I will try to include a video at the end of, of the process of putting this on the long arm quilting machine but I got all of the quilting done I'm very happy with how it turned out it's got butterflies um, dragon flies, um, honeybees, little flowers. Um, I just need to get this all, um, put the binding on the edges now and it will be ready to hang on the wall. So I've got about four places in mind that I would like to put it and I just have to decide for sure where I want it. So very excited about that, having that done. This was a quilt that I started, oh goodness, something like 10 years ago. So nine, 10 years ago, I think. So I'm very excited to have it done and about ready to hang on the wall. So that's um, that's my quilting project. And like I said, I, I'll, I'll try to put a little clip um, of me showing how I quilted that at the end. So crafting wise, that's about it. And then um, as far as garden journeys, um, like I said, we are just about to the end of garden season, except for the fall garden, um, which we do on a smaller basis. So, um, again, I, I took some video of our fall garden and I'll try to stick that at the end as well. So you can see that, um, we are definitely still preserving things. I, I enjoy dehydrating, um, I obviously I like to try different things new things so every year I try dehydrating things but I have trouble getting them used um, so this year I actually I kind of went backwards I found recipes for things using dehydrated ingredients um, and then went okay now I have to get the ingredients dried so I'm hoping that this year that will help me actually use the things that um, that I have prepared so dehydrating is one of the uh, one of the oldest and simplest ways to preserve food if you haven't tried it um, the investment in supplies can be absolutely nothing if you want you can do this with your oven you can do it with um, solar just in the air um, there's there's various ways and tons of information on the internet of how to do it I have a very basic Nesco brand, um, bought at the big box store, um, not all that expensive. I wanna say I may have spent around $60 a couple years ago on it. Um, it works great. It's not fancy. It's probably not as efficient as some of the, the big guy dehydrators, the like the Excaliburs that are awesome machines, but, um, but it definitely does a good job. So, I have been um, 
after the rains, our tomato plants kind of went, ooh, okay, we're, we're back. So again, I hope the glare you can see, but um, there's about five pounds or so of tomatoes. This was probably, I'm trying to remember, probably about 25 small tomatoes probably about like this, this size, um, that I dehydrated up. And look how you can see the color. What I plan to do with this, we'll see, but what I plan to do is I've got a bunch more I need to dehydrate. I'm waiting for them to um, ripen just a little bit more because you definitely want to get these just right at the peak of, fl of flavor just um, to lock in all that, that best tomato flavor. Um, I cut them. For this batch, I just sliced them up like you would to put on a sandwich, put them on the dehydrator on some screens um, that come with the dehydrator, and um, let them dry for... Unfortunately, I was doing these when we were having all of that rain, so the air was really humid, so it took longer than it... It probably took 16-ish hours to dry. Um, but when they're done, they're just real crisp and brittle. And then my plan is to put them in... Um, either the blender or I have a coffee grinder that I use for dehydrated foods that I can make a powder. So I'll use tomato powder and then you can rehydrate that into pizza sauce, spaghetti sauce, um, a base for like a vegetable soup, something like that, that you want a, um, a tomato base soup. So I have a lot more to do, but they're just so pretty and that, that, that bright color, um, just to store in the pantry. I mean, they're pretty, if nothing else. If you never use them, they're pretty. <laughs> but I'm hoping that I can can use those a whole lot more. This would be, I'm trying to think, this number, if I had canned the sauce, would probably be somewhere on the, probably five-ish pints of sauce. But instead, I've got them in this jar. And when I get them powdered, I'll have half or less. So as far as storage goes, it's an awesome way to store stuff. Um, the other thing that I did is my onions. Okay, so story on the onions. We have a produce auction near us, just about seven miles north. And every, well, twice a week, Tuesdays and Fridays, you can go up, anybody can go up, and it's basically a wholesale auction. So people can bring things to sell, um, you can buy, anybody is welcome to buy. A lot of the area farmers marketers actually go up there, and like if they're not growing enough cucumbers, then they go up to the produce market and um, buy cucumbers, tomatoes, whatever, and then um, bring them back to town and sell them. So, um, We've, we've been going up quite a bit just for fun. We've been buying watermelons and, um, you know, sometimes you can get watermelons for a dollar or less. We've got a friend that bought a bunch for 25 cents a piece because there was just so many of them. Um, it's, it's a small market and so sometimes you can get some pretty cool stuff out there. The, the hitch is they usually sell things in bulk. So you're buying we bought 34 watermelons one time and then we just had fun giving them away to people and they, they were good. I actually did dehydrate some watermelon. I haven't used it yet, but it turned out way better than I thought. It's pretty. Um, and I may powder that. My plan there again is to use it more as a flavoring. So you can put it in like a clear gelatin and then you've got supposedly, haven't tried it, but you've got real watermelon flavor instead of a um, commercial, just a, a flavorant. Um, you've got the real thing. So um, I've also heard that you can use it like in cakes, cookies, things like that. So I'm trying it. But back to my story. I went um, up there and got a couple bags, 10 pound bags of onions and put those, dehydrated those. So again, here's, um, I have a quart and a half of dehydrated onions and that was about eight pounds of onions. So again, just a crazy space saver. Um, wonderful flavor. I also did um, started doing some of our peppers. And again, both of these I will some of these I will leave whole and in, in the rings and some of them I will go ahead and powder. So I've got um, onion powder to put in recipes. Um, and then I can also mix um, some onion powder, some pepper powder. Um, I hope to do some celery. Um, I have garlic that's curing. 
and then I can put that into my tomato paste uh, or tomato sauce that I use from the tomato powder. So I can actually make a homemade sauce, like spaghetti sauce, pizza, whatever. Um, I, can, I can make my own homemade out of all dehydrated vegetables. So we'll try. <laughs> I haven't done a lot of that. Um, I have made garlic powder. Um, I've dried ginger. Um, of course, all the fruits. Um, pears are amazing. If you get the dessert pears that are really sweet anyway, when you dehydrate them in slices, all of that sugar, natural sugar, just crystallizes on the top. And oh my goodness, they're like candy. Um, and then everybody, you know, dried apples are an awesome snack. Um, we have um, some Amish friends near us that make the fried pies, like the hand pies, and they were so good. Um, and I asked her one day um, at farmer's market, I was talking to her and I said, um, you know, how, how do you make your, what kind of filling do you make? And she said, oh, these are dried apple pies. So I'm gonna try drying some that I can rehydrate and use in, in pies and, and cakes and things like that as well. So just a little bit different method of, of preserving definitely an old traditional craft. Um, a lot of this YouTube is, there's just so many different, I, I know how to dehydrate things, but um, it's so much fun today to be able to, just like knitting, being able to run to YouTube and grab a, um, a tutorial on a knit stitch that you're not familiar with. Um, same thing with this. So just checking out five or six different quick video clips and seeing um, what other people have tried, what worked, what didn't, and maybe be able to have a little bit more success on my first try. So I've definitely done that a lot. And then um, a resource I got as a Christmas gift a few years ago, um, Dehydrator Cookbook. And what I like about this, she has amazing tips for everything. And I'll put all the information, author and all that below. Um, she has great tips on how to dehydrate just about anything. Some crazy stuff that, like, why would you dehydrate that? Um, but some really good ideas. A lot of tips on pre preparing things. Um, for example, I was working on the onions. If you've done much cooking with onions, you know it can be a painful process for your eyes. So, wasn't really looking forward to slicing up 10 pounds of onions to put in the dehydrator. Tip number one that she had in this was freeze your onions, and maybe I'm just the last person to know this, but put your onions in the freezer for about 30 minutes to an hour or so before you slice them. Made a big difference. Really did make a difference, especially when you're doing um, something like this or if you're gonna be cooking with them. Um, and I really didn't notice that the onions were, in that little bit of time, they weren't really icy or anything, so they'd probably be just fine for slicing to put on a hamburger too. And then she also said, because one of, one of the problems you have with dehydrating onions is not only is it painful when you slice them, but then you've got the fragrance of onions in your house <laughs> for, you know, 10, 12 hours while you're dehydrating them. And she suggested that you blanch the onions. So cut them up in the rings, separate all the rings, or at least I separated all the rings out. And then blanching is just simply putting them in either steaming or putting them in um, boiling water for just a few seconds, 20 to 30 seconds is usually, um, is what's recommended with onions. Um, so you, you quick flash, get them hot, and then put them in ice water and stop that cooling. So you cook them fast, you cool them fast, and it, it actually helps it does several things, and I'm not the best person to explain it all, but um, one thing it does is helps kind of kill any any harmful th organisms that are on your vegetable. You do this also a lot for freezing. Um, so when I freeze my green beans, corn, um, it makes the things easier to peel. So when you're doing, um, when I can my peaches, um, even when I'm canning my tomatoes, I'll just quickly put them in, um, in, in some boiling water and then put them in ice water and then the skins just fall right off. So there's there's a lot of good things that happen with, with when you blanch. But with the onions, one of the things was um, they stay whiter. Usually, when I, in the past when I've done onions, they get this kind of like a toasted coconut appearance, just a little bit toasty. And they're pretty, but this time they stayed white, just white, white. 
Um, so that was pretty and they didn't smell and I wasn't sure my fear was that doing that you lose a lot of the ch onion juice just in the process of dipping them in water you lose some of that juice and I thought what's that gonna do to the flavor but I did about half of the batch blanching them and about half of the onions um, I ran out of time I just needed to get the dehydrator full so I just sliced them and put them on there I could definitely tell a difference a in slicing them um, the difference that it made just putting them in the freezer um, and then the blanching I I did not have any problem with dehydrating those in the house um, I don't have a place right now where I have like a covered porch or something like that where I can get them out of the house if you have that I know in the past I have set them outside um, and let them dehydrate outside like overnight and um, didn't have that option where I live now so it was it was a, a noticeable difference between the blanched and the unblanched in the amount of volatile um, compounds that you had and it was much more pleasant when I was doing the blanched ones than the ones that weren't so so much even it, it, it just whether it's knitting, fiber arts of other kinds, quilting, um, gardening, there is always so much new stuff, um, so much new information, and, and maybe not even new information, but things you've never tried a certain way. So I have another thing I'm going to be doing, um, this next, next batch of tomatoes, I'm gonna try drying them a little bit different. I'm actually going to try to um, cook them down and make them into a um, almost sauce, um, like a stewed tomato consistency, blend them up, and then dry them as a fruit leather. Um, some people say that's the only way. Some people say slicing them is the only way. So I'm going to, I have a lot of tomatoes right now. I'm going to try both and see if there's any difference. So that's um, a few things I have on, on the docket for this next week or two. We also have all of our, um, we had a big um, harvest of butternut squash. And those will keep for quite a while. I'm not in a hurry for those. Um, but I've run into a lot of articles on pumpkin powder. So we make all of our pumpkin pies and um, that anything with, that calls for pumpkin, we actually use butternut squash. It has a little bit deeper orange color and just a little bit, uh, to me it's sweeter. It's what I grew up with. So to me, um, the first time I tried a real pumpkin pumpkin pie, I was disappointed because I was so used to the butternut squash. So it, it's all what you grow up with, what, what you are used to. But I had, um, I had the thought we usually will go ahead and cook down a bunch of them because we don't have the best climate for holding things long term. And there's always a chance of mice getting into them. Out, we keep them out in our garage and um, we can keep them cool and dark, but you have a chance of mice getting in or um, they just kind of start to shrivel eventually. So a lot of times we'll go ahead and f and cook them down and freeze them. So it's more like a canned um, puree. But pumpkins are one thing that are not safe to can in a puree. You can can chunks, um, but it's kind of a long process. It takes a lot of energy. It's great results. Um, but just not my preferred way of preserving pumpkin. So usually we go ahead and make a puree and freeze it. And we can freeze it in the amounts that we'll need for a pumpkin pie or whatever. So very convenient that way. Um, but I thought this time, again, we have more pumpkin. We're still using butternut squash, sorry, pumpkin, um, from last year. We still have some in the freezer. So this year I thought, okay, I've got some extra. This is my chance to try it. So I have some cooked down and... Um, I had to get all of my dehydrator trays from these guys all cleaned up because you really don't want onion taste in your pumpkin pie. At least I don't. So got all of my trays all cleaned up um, yesterday and I'm hoping this next week to try doing pumpkin. We'll see how that turns out. So always something new to try and apples should be coming into um, our area here soon in the next month or so and I'll be dehydrating a bunch of apples um, I may do some canned pie filling as well so I've got a lot of things yet I want to try this fall so lots going on like I said it's I I feel kind of silly in that I'm I'm doing a little of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of this and not much of any one thing but again welcome to my chaotic crafting life 
So I hope you enjoyed my adventures from the last couple of weeks. Thank you so much for coming back to visit with me. I hope you will come back again next time. And if there's anything that, um, that I've done, I will put um, as many links as I can remember as I can find down below. But I'm always open to, I love the questions I've been getting. Um, so feel free to reach out to me. I'll put all my contact information below and at the end. Thank you so much for coming back to my basket. Bye. Several of you asked about our fall garden. So here's what things look like right now. We've got cucumbers growing on the fence that are producing. One crop of green beans. These are a little bit later. On the other side, these are the ones that we just started picking. I see my mom's stool there. We've got some basil, dill, carrots, lettuce, springs, peppers. Now that we've had rain, are starting to bear a lot better. And I think she's got some pak choy, beets, spinach. And then in the back, this is a <laughs> this is a gamble, but that's gardening. We planted some late popcorn. Uh, Critter's got all of our popcorn in our other garden, so we thought we'd rip this up, space up, um, and see if there was time for it to make. It's tasseled, the ears are starting to form, so fingers crossed, might work, you never know. And over here is broccoli, cabbage, some kale, I think there's some Swiss chard in there. The rest of the garden has pretty much been cleared out, we're looking a little and those tomatoes are looking sad, but they're still bearing, especially once we got that rain. And we're supposed to have rain again today, so they're still giving us a lot of food out of it. They just look a little pathetic. So that's, that's our fall garden. Finally got this wall hang that I showed you a while back on my podcast on the quilting frame. Several people asked about long arm quilting. There it is. One big giant sewing machine. Right now it's set up to do edge to edge quilting. Sorry, I don't have my stand for my phone here. So, hope I'm not making anybody seasick. Right now, it's kind of doing fancy doodles. This is computer guided. So basically, shut this off for just a second. Basically, I have a computer system over here. This is a gamel machine. And I set up the pattern. Basically, CAD drafting at this point, which sounds scary. Made all my adjustments, made sure it fits where I want it to on the quilt. And then come over here. That translates to my great big giant machine and then from then if I've done my job correctly I should just be able to let it go so we talk about butterflies here's how a butterfly is born in the quilting world Thing. Or at least one version of it.